Moby Dick, chapters 119 to 123. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 119 to 123. Chapter 119 The Candles Warmest climes but nurse the cruelest fangs. The tiger of Bengal crouches in spiced groves of ceaseless verdure. Skies the most effulgent but basket the deadliest thunders. Gorgeous Cuba knows tornadoes that never swept tame northern lands. So, too, is it that in these resplendent Japanese seas the mariner encounters the direst of all storms, the typhoon. It will sometimes burst out of that cloudless sky like an exploding bomb upon a dazed and sleepy town. Towards evening of that day the Pequod was torn of her canvas, and bare poled was left to fight a typhoon which had struck her directly ahead. When darkness came on, sky and sea roared and split with the thunder, and blazed with the lightning, that showed the disabled mass fluttering here and there with the rags which the first fury of the tempest had left for its after sport. Holding by a shroud, Starbuck was standing on the quarter-deck, at every flash of the lightning glancing aloft to see what additional disaster might have befallen the intricate hamper there, while Stubb and Flask were directing the men in the higher hoisting and firmer lashing of the boats. But all their pains seemed not. Though lifted to the very top of the cranes, the windward quarter-boat, Ahab's, did not escape. A great rolling sea, dashing high up against the reeling ship's high teetering side, stove in the boat's bottom at the stern, and left it again, all dripping through like a sieve. "'Bad work?' "'Bad work, Mr. Starbuck,' said Stubb, regarding the wreck. "'But the sea will have its way. Stubb, for one, can't fight it. "'You see, Mr. Starbuck, a wave has such a great long start before it leaps. "'All round the world it runs, and then comes the spring. "'But as for me, all the start I have to meet it is just across the deck here. "'But never mind. It's all in fun, so the old song says. "'Sings.' O oh, jolly is the gale, and a joker is the whale, a flourish in his tail. Such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey-pokey lad is the ocean O. Oh. The scud all a-flyin, that's his flip-only foeman, when he stirs in the spicin. Such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey-pokey lad is the ocean O. Oh. Thunder splits the ship, but he only smacks his lips, a tastin' of this flip. Such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey-pokey lad is the ocean, no. Oh. A vast stub, cried Starbuck. Let the typhoon sing and strike his harp here in our rigging. But if thou art a brave man, thou wilt hold thy peace. But I am not a brave man. Never said I was a brave man. I am a coward, and I sing to keep up my spirits. And I'll tell you what it is, Mr. Starbuck. There's no way to stop my singing in this world but to cut my throat. And when that's done, ten to one I sing ye the doxology for a wind-up. Madman, look through my eyes if thou hast none of thine own. What? How can you see better of a dark night than anybody else? Never mind how foolish. Here, cried Starbuck, seizing Stubb by the shoulder, and pointing his hand towards the weather-bow. Marks thou not that the gale comes from the eastward? The very course Ahab is to run from Moby Dick? The very course he swung to this day noon? Now mark his boat there. Where is that stove? In the stern-sheets, man, where he is wont to stand. His standpoint is stove, man. Now jump overboard and sing away if thou must. I don't half understand ye. What's in the wind? Yes, yes, round the Cape of Good Hope is the shortest way to Nantucket, soliloquized Starbuck suddenly, heedless of Stubb's question. The gale that now hammers at us to stave us, we can turn it into a fair wind that will drive us towards home. Yonder to windward is all blackness of doom, but to leeward, homeward, 
I see it lightens up there, but not with the lightning. At that moment, in one of the intervals of profound darkness, following the flashes, a voice was heard at his side, and almost at the same instant a volley of thunder peals rolled overhead. Who's there? Old Thunder, said Ahab, groping his way along the bulwarks to his pivot hole, but suddenly finding his path made plain to him by elbowed lances of fire. Now, as the lightning-rod to a spire on shore is intended to carry off the perilous fluid into the soil, so the kindred-rod which at sea some ships carry to each mast is intended to conduct it into the water. But as this conductor must descend to considerable depth, that its end may avoid all contact with the hull, and as, moreover, if kept constantly towing there, it would be liable to many mishaps, besides interfering not a little with some of the rigging, and more or less impeding the vessel's way in the water. Because of all this, the lower parts of a ship's lightning rods are not always overboard, but are generally made in long slender links, so as to be the more readily hauled up into the chains outside, or thrown down into the sea, as occasion may require. "'The rods! The rods!' cried Starbuck to the crew, suddenly admonished to vigilance by the vivid lightning that had just been darting flambeau to light Ahab to his post. "'Are they overboard? Drop them over, fore and aft! Quick!' "'Avast!' cried Ahab. "'Let's have fair play here, though we be the weaker side. Yet I'll contribute to raise rods on the Himalayas and Andes, that all the world may be secured, but out on privileges.' Let them be, sir. Look aloft, cried Starbuck. The corpusants, the corpusants. All the yard arms were tipped with a pallid fire, and, touched at each tri pointed lightning rod end with three tapering white flames, each of the three tall masts was silently burning in that sulphurous air, like three gigantic wax tapers before an altar. "'Blast the boat! Let it go!' cried Stubb at this instant, as a swashing sea heaved up under his own little craft, so that its gunwale violently jammed his hand as he was passing a lashing. "'Blast it!' But slipping backwards on the deck, his uplifted eyes caught the flames, and immediately shifting his tone, he cried, "'The corpusants have mercy on us all!' To sailors, oaths are household words. They will swear in the trance of the calm, and in the teeth of the tempest. They will imprecate curses from the topsail yard arms when most they teeter over to a seething sea. But in all my voyagings, seldom have I heard a common oath when God's burning finger has been laid upon the ship, when his mine mine tekel uparsin has been woven into the shrouds and the cordage. While this pallidness was burning aloft, few words were heard from the enchanted crew, who in one thick cluster stood on the forecastle, all their eyes gleaming in that pale phosphorescence like a faraway constellation of stars. Relieved against the ghostly light, the gigantic jet negro Dagu loomed up to thrice his real stature, and seemed the black cloud from which the thunder had come. The parted mouth of Tashtego revealed his shark-white teeth, which strangely gleamed as if they too had been tipped by corpusants, while, lit up by the preternatural light, Queequeg's tattooing burned like satanic blue flames on his body. The tableau all waned at last with the pallidness aloft, and once more the Pequod and every soul on her decks were wrapped in a pall. A moment or two passed, when Starbuck, going forward, pushed against someone. It was Stubb. "'What thinkest thou now, man? I heard thy cry. It was not the same in the song.' "'No, it wasn't. I said, the corpusants have mercy on us all, and I hope they will, still. But do they only have mercy on long faces? Have they no bowels for a laugh? And look you, Mr. Starbuck, but it's too dark for a look. Hear me, then.' I take that masthead flame we saw for a sign of good luck, for those masts are rooted in a hold that is going to be chock-a-block with sperm oil, do you see? And so all that sperm oil will work up into the mast, like sap in a tree. Yes, our three masts will yet be as three spermaceti candles. That's the good promise we saw. 
At that moment Starbuck caught sight of Stubb's face slowly beginning to glimmer into sight. Glancing upwards, he cried, See? See? And once more the high, tapering flames were beheld with what seemed redoubled supernaturalness in their pallor. The corpusants have mercy on us all, cried Stubb again. At the base of the mainmast, full beneath the doubloon and the flame, the Parsee was kneeling in Ahab's front, but with his head bowed away from him, while nearby, from the arched and overhanging rigging, where they had just been engaged in securing a spar, a number of the seamen, arrested by the glare, now cohered together, and hung pendulous, like a knot of numbed wasps from a drooping orchard twig in various enchanted attitudes, like the standing or stepping or running skeletons in Herculaneum, others remained rooted to the deck, but all their eyes upcast. Aye, aye, men, cried Ahab, look up at it, mark it well, the white flame but lights the way to the white whale. Hand me those mainmast links there. I would fain feel this pulse, and let mine beat against it blood against fire. So. Then, turning, the last link held fast in his left hand, he put his foot upon the parsi, and with fixed upward eye and high-flung right arm, he stood erect before the lofty, tri-pointed trinity of flames. Oh, thou clear spirit of clear fire, whom on these seas I as Persian once did worship, till in the sacramental act so burned by thee, that to this hour I bear the scar. I now know thee, thou clear spirit, and I now know that thy right worship is defiance. To neither love nor reverence wilt thou be kind, and e'en for hate thou canst but kill, and all are killed. No fearless fool now fronts thee. I own thy speechless, placeless power, but to the last gasp of my earthquake life will dispute its unconditional, unintegral mastery in me. In the midst of the personified impersonal, a personality stands here. Though but a point at best, whencesoever I came, whencesoever I go, yet while I earthly live, the queenly personality lives in me and feels her royal rights. But war is pain, and hate is woe. Come in thy lowest form of love, and I will kneel and kiss thee. But at thy highest come as mere supernal power. And though thou launchest navies of full-freighted worlds, there's that in here that still remains indifferent. O oh, thou clear spirit, of thy fire thou madest me, and like a true child of fire I breathe it back to thee. Sudden repeated flashes of lightning, the nine flames leap lengthwise to thrice their previous height. Ahab, with the rest, closes his eyes, his right hand pressed hard upon them. I own thy speechless, placeless power, said I not so? Nor was it wrung from me, nor do I now drop these links. Thou canst blind, but I can then grope. Thou canst consume, but I can then be ashes. Take the homage of these poor eyes and shudder hands. I would not take it. The lightning flashes through my skull. Mine eyeballs ache and ache. My whole beaten brain seems as beheaded and rolling on some stunning ground. Oh, oh! Yet blindfold, yet will I talk to thee. Light though thou be, thou leapest out of darkness. But I am darkness leaping out of light, leaping out of thee. The javelins cease. Open eyes, see or not. There burn the flames. O oh, thou magnanimous, now I do glory in my genealogy. But thou art but my fiery father. My sweet mother I know not. O oh, cruel, what hast thou done with her? There lies my puzzle, but thine is greater. Thou knowest not how came ye, hence callest thyself unbegotten. Certainly knowest not thy beginning, hence callest thyself unbegun. I know that of me which thou knowest not of thyself, O thou omnipotent. There is some unsuffusing thing beyond thee, thou clear spirit, to whom all thy eternity is but time, 
all thy creativeness mechanical. Through thee, thy flaming self, my scorched eyes do dimly see it. O oh, thou foundling fire, thou hermit immemorial! Thou too hast thy incommunicable riddle, thy unparticipated grief. Here again, with haughty agony, I read my sire. Leap, leap up and lick the sky. I leap with thee, I burn with thee, would fain be welded with thee. Defyingly, I worship thee. The boat, the boat, cried Starbuck. Look at thy boat, old man. Ahab's harpoon, the one forged at Perth's fire, remained firmly lashed in its conspicuous crotch, so that it projected beyond his whaleboat's bow. But the sea that had stove its bottom had caused the loose leather sheath to drop off, and from the keen steel barb there now came a leveled flame of pale, forked fire. As the silent harpoon burned there like a serpent's tongue, Starbuck grasped Ahab by the arm. God! God is against thee, old man! Forbear! "'Tis an ill voyage, ill begun, ill continued. "'Let me square the yards while we may, old man, "'and make a fair wind of it homewards, "'to go on a better voyage than this.' "'Overhearing Starbuck, the panic-stricken crew "'instantly ran to the braces, "'though not a sail was left aloft. "'For the moment all the aghast mate's thoughts seemed theirs. "'They raised a half-mutinous cry, but dashing the rattling lightning links to the deck, and snatching the burning harpoon, Ahab waved it like a torch among them, swearing to transfix with it the first sailor that but cast loose a rope's end. Petrified by his aspect, and still more shrinking from the fiery dart that he held, the men fell back in dismay, and Ahab again spoke. "'All your oaths to hunt the white whale are as binding as mine, and heart soul and body, lungs and life, old Ahab is bound. And that ye may know to what tune this heart beats, look ye here, thus I blow out the last fear. And with one blast of his breath he extinguished the flame. As in the hurricane that sweeps the plain men fly the neighborhood of some lone gigantic elm, whose very height and strength but render it so much the more unsafe, because so much the more a mark for thunderbolts. So at those last words of Ahab's, many of the mariners did run from him in a terror of dismay. Chapter 120 The Deck Towards the End of the First Night Watch Ahab Standing by the Helm Starbuck Approaching Him We must send down the main topsail yard, sir. The band is working loose, and the lee lift is half-stranded. Shall I strike it, sir? Strike nothing. Lash it. If I had sky-sail poles, I'd sway them up now. Sir, in God's name. Sir? Well? The anchors are working, sir. Shall I get them inboard? Strike nothing and stir nothing, but lash everything. The wind rises, but it has not got up to my table-lands yet. Quick and see to it. By masts and keels. He takes me for the hunchbacked skipper of some coasting smack. Send down my main topsail yard. Ha! Glue pots. Loftiest trucks were made for wildest winds, and this brain truck of mine now sails amid the cloud scud. Shall I strike that? Oh, none but cowards send down their brain trucks in tempest time. What a hooroo shall off there! I would e'en take it for sublime, did I not know that the colic is a noisy malady. Oh, take medicine, take medicine. Chapter 121 Midnight, the Foxel Bulwarks Stub and flask mounted on them, and passing additional lashings over the anchors there hanging. No, Stub, you may pound that knot there as much as you please, but you will never pound into me what you were just now saying. And how long ago is it since you said the very contrary? Didn't you once say that whatever ship Ahab sails in, that ship should pay something extra on its insurance policy, just as though it were loaded with powder barrels aft and boxes of lucifers forward? Stop now, didn't you say so? 
Well, suppose I did. What then? I've part changed my flesh since that time. Why not my mind? Besides, supposing we are loaded with powder barrels aft and lucifers forward, how the devil should the lucifers get a fire in this drenching spray here? Why, my little man, you have pretty red hair, but you couldn't get a fire now. Shake yourself. Your Aquarius or the water-bearer flask might fill pitchers at your coat-collar. Don't you see, then, that for these extra risks the marine insurance companies have extra guarantees? Here are hydrants, flask. But hark again, then I'll answer you the other thing. First take your leg off from the crown of the anchor here, though, so I can pass the rope. Now listen. What's the mighty difference between holding a mass lightning rod in the storm and standing close by a mass that hasn't got any lightning rod at all in a storm? Don't you see, you timberhead, that no harm can come to the holder of the rod unless the mast is first struck? What are you talking about, then? Not one ship in a hundred carries rods, and Ahab, I, man, and all of us, were in no more danger then, in my poor opinion, than all the crews in ten thousand ships now sailing the seas. Why, you, King Post, you, I suppose, would have every man in the world go about with a small lightning rod running up the corner of his hat, like a militia officer's skewered feather, and trailing behind like his sash. Why don't you be sensible, Flask? It's easy to be sensible. Why don't you, then? Any man with half an eye can be sensible. I don't know that, Stubb. You sometimes find it rather hard. Yes, when a fellow's soaked through, it's hard to be sensible, that's a fact. And I am about drenched with this spray. Never mind, catch the turn there and pass it. Seems to me we are lashing down these anchors now as if they were never going to be used again. Tying these two anchors here, Flask, seems like tying a man's hands behind him. And what big generous hands they are, to be sure. These are your iron fists, eh? What a hold they have, too. I wonder, Flask, whether the world is anchored anywhere. If she is, she swings with an uncommon long cable, though. There, hammer that knot down, and we're done. So, next to touching land, lighting on deck is most satisfactory. I say, just wring out my jacket skirts, will you? Thank you. They laugh at long togs, so, Flask. But it seems to me a long-tailed coat ought always to be worn in storms afloat. The tails tapering down that way serve to carry off the water, do you see? Same with cocked hats. The cocks form gable-end eave-troughs, flasks. No more monkey jackets and tarpaulins for me. I must mount a swallow-tail and drive down a beaver, so. Hello! Whew! There goes my tarpaulin overboard! Lord, Lord, that the winds that come from heaven should be so unmannerly. This is a nasty night, lad. Chapter 122 Midnight aloft. Thunder and lightning. The main topsail yard. Tashtego passing new lashings around it. Um, um, um. Stop that thunder. Plenty too much thunder up here. What's the use of thunder? Um, um, um. We don't want thunder, we want rum. Give us a glass of rum. Um, um, um. Chapter 123 The Musket During the most violent shocks of the typhoon, the man at the Pequod's jawbone tiller had several times been reelingly hurled to the deck by its spasmodic motions, even though preventer tackles had been attached to it for they were slack, because some play to the tiller was indispensable. In a severe gale like this, while the ship is but a tossed shuttlecock to the blast, it is by no means uncommon to see the needles in the compasses at intervals go round and round. It was thus with the Pequods. At almost every shock the helmsman had not failed to notice the whirling velocity with which they revolved upon the cards. It is a sight that hardly anyone can behold without some sort of unwanted emotion. Some hours after midnight the typhoon abated so much that through the strenuous exertions of Starbuck and Stubb, one engaged forward and the other aft, the shivered remnants of the jib and fore and main topsails were cut adrift from the spars, and went eddying away to leeward like the feathers of an albatross, which sometimes are cast to the winds when that storm-tossed bird is on the wing. 
The three corresponding new sails were now bent and reefed, and a storm trysail was set further aft, so that the ship soon went through the water with some precision again, and the course, for the present east-south-east, which he was to steer, if practicable, was once more given to the helmsman, for during the violence of the gale he had only steered according to its vicissitudes, but as he was now bringing the ship as near her course as possible, watching the compass needle meanwhile, lo, a good sign, the wind seemed coming round astern. Aye, the foul breeze became fair. Instantly the yards were squared, to the lively song of Ho the fair wind, O ye ho cheerily men, the crew singing for joy, that so promising an event should so soon have falsified the evil portents preceding it. In compliance with the standing order of his commander, to report immediately, and at any one of the twenty-four hours, any decided change in the affairs of the deck, Starbuck had no sooner trimmed the yards to the breeze, however reluctantly and gloomily, than he mechanically went below to apprise Captain Ahab of the circumstance. Ere knocking at his stateroom door, he involuntarily paused before it a moment. The cabin lamp, taking long swings this way and that, was burning fitfully, and casting fitful shadows upon the old man's bolted door, a thin one, with fixed blinds inserted in place of upper panels. The isolated subterraneousness of the cabin made a certain humming silence to reign there, though it was hooped round by all the roar of the elements. The loaded muskets in the rack were shiningly revealed, as they stood upright against the forward bulkhead. Starbuck was an honest, upright man, but out of Starbuck's heart, at that instant when he saw the muskets, there strangely evolved an evil thought, but so blent with its neutral or good accompaniments that for the instant he hardly knew it for itself. He would have shot me once, he murmured. Yes, there's the very musket that he pointed at me, that one with the studded stock. Let me touch it, lift it. Strange that I, who have handled so many deadly lances, strange that I should shake so now. Loaded? I must see. Aye, aye. And powder in the pan. That's not good. Best spill it. Wait. I'll cure myself of this. I'll hold the musket boldly while I think. I come to report a fair wind to him. But how fair? Fair for death and doom. That's fair for Moby Dick. It's a fair wind that's only fair for that accursed fish. The very tube he pointed at me. The very one. This one. I hold it here. He would have killed me with the very thing I handle now. Aye, and he would fain kill all his crew. Does he not say that he will not strike his spars to any gale? Has he not dashed his heavenly quadrant? And in these same perilous seas gropes he not his way by mere dead reckoning of the error-abounding log? And in this very typhoon did he not swear that he would have no lightning-rods? But shall this crazed old man be tamely suffered to drag a whole ship's company down to doom with him? Yes, it would make him the willful murderer of thirty men and more, if this ship come to any deadly harm, and come to deadly harm my soul swears this ship will, if Ahab have his way. If, then, he were this instant, put aside, that crime would not be his. Ha! <sighs> Is he muttering in his sleep? Yes, just there. In there he's sleeping. Sleeping, aye, but still alive, and soon awake again. I can't withstand thee, old man. Not reasoning, not remonstrance, not entreaty wilt thou hearken to. All this thou scornest. Flat obedience to thy own flat commands. This is all thou breathest. Ay, and sayest the men have vowed thy vow. Sayest all of us are Ahab's. Great God forbid. But is there no other way? No lawful way? Make him a prisoner to be taken home? What, hope to wrest this old man's living power from his own living hands? Only a fool would try it. Say he were pinioned, even. 
knotted all over with ropes and hawsers, chained down to ring bolts on his cabin floor. He would be more hideous than a caged tiger then. I could not endure the sight, could not possibly fly his howlings. All comfort, sleep itself, inestimable reason would leave me on the long, intolerable voyage. What then remains? The land is hundreds of leagues away, and locked Japan the nearest. I stand alone here upon an open sea, with two oceans and a whole continent between me and law. Aye, aye, tis so. Is heaven a murderer, when its lightning strikes a would-be murderer in his bed, tindering sheets and skin together? And would I be a murderer, then, if— and slowly, stealthily, and half sideways looking, he placed the loaded musket's end against the door. On this level Ahab's hammock swings within, his head this way. A touch, and Starbuck may survive to hug his wife and child again. Oh, Mary, Mary, boy, boy, boy! But if I wake thee not to death, old man, who can tell to what unsounded deeps Starbuck's body this day week may sink with all the crew? Great God, where art thou? Shall I? Shall I? The wind has gone down and shifted, sir. The fore and main topsails are reefed and set. She heads her course. Stern all, O oh, Moby Dick! I clutch thy heart at last. Such were the sounds that now came hurtling from out the old man's tormented sleep, as if Starbuck's voice had caused a long, dumb dream to speak. The yet leveled musket shook like a drunkard's arm against the panel. Starbuck seemed wrestling with an angel, but turning from the door he placed the death tube in its rack and left the place. He's too sound asleep, Mr. Stubb. Go thou down and wake him and tell him. I must see to the deck here. Thou knowest what to say. End of chapters 119 to 123